to do is ensure that you've got the correct equipment to take blood. So in front of me here I've got all the essential equipment that we would need to take blood. And the first thing that you'll notice is that we have a tourniquet and you put this around the patient and tighten it up to above systolic pressure so that you, um, you actually get the veins to fill up with blood so they're easy to see and feel and then therefore easier to actually get the blood from. Now, you can either use a, a needle and syringe, we've got a couple of di different needles here. Um, if you can see, the, the colours on these are different, and that's because different needles are different sizes, and they're usually colour-coded according to the size. Um, an alternative system is the vacutainer. Now, this has a needle on one side and a, a needle on the other that screws into this device here, um, and that then attaches to these blood bottles which we call vacutainers and there's different colour blood bottles depending on which blood test that you want to do. Um, we'll talk a bit in depth about the advantages of using the vacutainer over the syringe and, and what situations you'd want to use it but the principal advantage of the vacutainer is there's a lower chance of actually getting a needle stick injury because once you've taken the blood from a, a needle and syringe you then have to put it into each one of the containers individually and you've got a chance of actually sticking yourself with a needle, whereas with vacutainer, you just pop these in automatically and they fill them with blood, so you don't have that problem. Now it's always important that you protect yourself, so you're going to need some gloves to protect you from bloodborne infection, and you're going to need a sharp spin so you can pop the needle in after you've used it, immediately after you've used it, again to, to prevent the chance of uh, needle stick injury. You need a cotton, cotton ball and some tape secured to the patient, and of course, you need an alcohol swab just to wash the patient with before you actually take blood if there's any gross contaminants on top of the skin because you don't want to give them an infection as well. So let's move on and show you how to actually take the blood itself. So, after you've got your equipment together, you need to make sure that you've got the correct patient. So, introduce yourself to the patient. Hello, my name's Hi. Reese, and I'm one of the doctors here. I've come to get a blood sample from you, is that okay? No problem. So it's always important that you uh, take consent, verbal consent for taking blood is fine. Um, could I just ask your full name please? It's Charlotte Longman. Okay, and what's your date of birth? 10th of the 7th, 1984. Okay, so two patient identifiable pieces of information just so you know you've definitely got the right patient. Um, so you've confirmed with them that they're happy for you to take the blood and you know that you've got the right patient. So the next thing that we need to do is pop the tourniquet on. And the best place to put the tourniquet is just around the bicep here. So you just pop it around like this, and tighten it up very nice and tight. And then the veins will start to, to fill with blood. Now it's important that you get the patient to relax their arm by their side to allow the veins to fill with blood. And you need it to be below the level of the heart, otherwise the veins won't fill. Um, now you'll notice that at this stage I don't have my gloves on. Now, this is not because I, I'm unhygienic, but it's actually because it's much easier to feel the veins without the gloves on before you've got any of your equipment together, before you've touched any of the needles, and before you've prepped the patient, just so you've got a good idea of where you're going to be taking the blood from later. Okay, once you've got the tourniquet on the patient, you want to make sure that they're in the, the best possible position for you to take blood. Um, in a clinic setting, it's often quite difficult to find a pillow, which we don't actually have here. But if you, if you did have one available, it's nice to allow the patient to rest their arm on top of the pillow. Next thing you want to do is actually have a look and select which vein you're going to take the blood from. So the best veins to take blood from are the ones that you can see and feel. So I, can, I know that the best veins are normally in the antecubital fossa, which is the back of the elbow in this region here. And in Charlotte, I can actually run my finger across the antecubital fossa and I can I feel a bounce to the best veins. I can feel along the direction of the veins and I can actually see the blue tinge and I know that I'm going to be able to get a good sample of blood from there. Now, if I wasn't able to find any good veins in the antecubital fossa, um, perhaps in a patient who has a little bit more fat tissue or um, a patient who's had a number of blood tests before when the veins are no longer usable, we then, use, we then look at other areas of the, the sort of forearm and hand for good veins. The back of the hand classically is a very good area as we can see here we've got some good veins in the back of the hand. These are often a little bit more painful to take blood from and generally we tend to use a smaller needle when we go in the back of the hand. Just running along through the, through the roof of the anatomical snuff box and up towards the, 
the forearm here, we've got the cephalic vein. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of junior doctors call it the houseman's best friend because uh, it's one of the easiest veins to find if you know where it is. And we can feel it and see it just running along here. Um, failing that, there are some really, really painful veins that you can get blood from in the back of the hand here. Now, in Charlotte, these are definitely not where I take blood from, but if you're really struggling in any of the other areas and it's really, really important to get blood, then you can get blood from the back of the hand there. Now, at this stage, I'm going to take the tourniquet off Charlotte, because it, as you can see, her hands become a bit mottled and I'm sure it's a little bit uncomfortable leaving a tourniquet on for this long. So you should always try and only leave the tourniquet on for as long as you need to, and uh, as soon as you've finished the procedure, take it off. So we'll move on, now that we've decided that we're going to you know, take blood from the antecubital fossa, we'll show you how to set up the various different devices and then actually show you how to take the blood itself. So at this stage of the procedure, the patient's comfortable, we've selected the veins in the antecubital fossa um, and this is the stage when we're actually going to prep our needles um, and when we need to make sure that we reduce the chance of infection for ourselves. So at this stage, this is when I'd actually put my gloves on Okay, often the most difficult part of the procedure for me, especially when I'm nervous in front of the camera. Okay, for this demonstration, we're going to show you how to use the vacutainer. Now, um, if you've got the choice between using a vacutainer or a syringe, I would always say that you should use the vacutainer for safety purposes in somebody who's got good veins that you can see and feel. The reason for that is that it's decreased chance of a needle stick. So what you do is this device just unscrews and you pull out that side, discard the side, and then it screws into this handy little device here. And with the cap on, it's protecting the needle. Once you've taken the cap off, you can see the needle with the bevel at the edge. Now, um, it's always best to keep the bevel with the tip point pointing up so you can, when you look down at the needle, you can see the whole cut section of the needle. Um, with the needle in that position, you can come towards the patient and just at an acute angle in the direction of the vein, using your thumb to stabilize the skin, you can just push the needle in through the skin in the direction of the vein and then hold it steady. Now, once it's in there, you're going to have to pop your blood bottles through the bottom of the, the other side of the device and they'll automatically fill up with blood because these have got a vacuum in, so it sucks the blood in. Now, we'll show that in one smooth mo movement in just one moment. Okay, so we're just going to prep the skin, a little alcoholic swab. Okay, warn the patient it's going to just be a bit uncomfortable, bear with me. Stabilising the other hand against the skin, you can get your blood bottle, hold these uh, end portions so you don't push the needle any further, force it so it breaks through the seal and then that automatically fills with blood. Once that blood bottle is full, you can withdraw, still holding this against the skin, try not to move so it's not uncomfortable for the patient. You can get another blood bottle, do the same thing and fill that until you've fit, filled all the blood bottles that you want. At that point, you want to release the tourniquet, get your cotton wool, place it over, be very careful, withdraw your needle, needle goes into the sharp skin, ask the patient to press down, you get some tape, tape it up, Thank the patient, thank you very much. Then you take your blood bottles, make sure that you label them correctly and send them away for the right tests and that's all done. Thank you. So at the end of the um, procedure, we've got the blood that we wanted to take, but at, at this point the blood bottles are actually unlabeled. Um, so we want to thank the patient very much, um, appreciate that. We go away, make sure that we label the correct details on each blood bottle, put them in the right um, forms and send them away to the lab to be analysed. Thank you very much. 
So you've seen the, the VAT container demonstrated in the, uh, the first um, vent puncture that we've shown on, on Charlotte. Um, we're going to talk a little bit in depth now about the advantages and disadvantages of both the VAT container and the needle and syringe. Now, in somebody like Charlotte who's got very visible, um, very easy to feel veins, the VAT container is obviously the most sensible option. Um, it only involves one needle and that needle should be kept away from you at all times, goes straight into the vein and you saw in the, in the last demonstration that these blood bottles filled straight away once we actually um, pushed them into the other side of the needle. Now, when some of these veins are actually quite poor, it can be really, really difficult to know when you're actually into the vein itself. Um, the most painful part of the procedure is going through the skin. Once you're in through the skin, and you know that you're in the vicinity of the vein, you can actually have a, a little bit of a feel around with the needle until you, you know that you're actually in the vein. With a vacutainer, it can be quite frustrating because you can, you can push your blood bottle on and actually nothing happens. Um, and at that point, you know that you're not in the vein and it is a little bit more difficult to, to feel around and, and um, get the needle into the right place so you can take blood. Now, the alternative to the vacutainer is the old fashioned syringe with a needle on. Now, it's a bit more fiddly, it does take a bit more practice, and the disadvantage is once the needle is on, you then take it out of a patient and you have to by hand inject in through the top of each of these vacuum tanks, which carries a danger because if you do it wrongly, you can end up kind of slipping and, and causing yourself a needle stick. But the advantages of the needle and syringe are that it does give you greater control over where you're putting the needle um, and it also allows you to aim for some of the smaller veins that we've talked about earlier on in, in uh, this demonstration. So the veins on the back of the hand, um, some of the veins in, in this area here, the cephalic vein, um, all these small veins in the back of the hand are much easier to, to um, get blood from with a smaller needle using the needle and syringe. Um, when you set up the needle and syringe, you want to choose the size of the needle. With a vacuum tank, you've only got the one choice. But with a needle and syringe, you can choose any needle that will fit onto the end of the, of the syringe. Um, generally speaking, the larger gauge needles that the common colour to use would be a green, should be using the antecubital fossa. Um, but they're a bit too large and a bit too uh, painful to use in, in the hand, in the, you know, particularly in the back of the hand, where you should try and use a, a blue or maybe even a gold needle. Um, of course, you need to check the sizing on the back um, because the colour coding might be different in your hospital. Okay, so we'll go on and we'll demonstrate exactly how you would take blood with the syringe now. Okay, um, we're using a different volunteer this time because I think it's a little bit unfair to subject the same person to more than one injection just for your uh, learning needs. So we've got the tourniquet on, we've consented to him, we know who he is. And we found a good vein here in the antecubital fossa. I'm just going to give it a quick wipe with the um, alcohol wipe just to clean any germs off. Then we've got a needle and syringe. Now I've selected a 10ml syringe and a blue needle. I'm just going to make sure we've got some movement in that syringe before I um, actually take the blood. Now looking at this, as we explained earlier, we're looking at the, the full cut surface of the needle, so the bevel is pointing upwards. You want to find the area that you're going to inject and in, uh, get the blood from. Come just distal. Use your index finger to stabilize the syringe. And just have a quick feel again. And just pop in through the skin. And if you can see there, we know that we're in the right place because we've instantly got some flashback. Now, Stabilising it against the skin, holding it steady, we then withdraw slowly. We then withdraw slowly, and we can see that we've got blood coming back. Now, this can be a little bit of a slow process in comparison to the uh, vacutainer, but you can carry on doing that until you've got as much blood as you need. Now, I'm quite glad that that happened in this demonstration. Um, the difference with using needles and, and syringe is that once you've got the flashback in the end of the needle, it has a tendency to clot unless you get the blood very quickly. So you may still be in the right position in the vein, 
but you're not actually able to withdraw blood back through the needle if you've left it for too long. And that can be something that can be a bit problematic. Okay, so we'll just hold that there. Thank you. So just to demonstrate the difficulty with um, the needle and syringe, once you've actually got a syringe full of blood, the dangers of, of actually putting it into the vacuum tins is that you then have to aim it into the centre and these needles are a little bit flexible and they can give a lot, a lot of wobble and you have to actually push quite hard to get them to, to go into the back container and there's always a danger that late at night when you're not paying very much attention um, you could actually miss and end up giving yourself a needle stick injury which you don't want to do. Um, of course once you've filled your, your vac container with blood you then have to withdraw the needle and do the same for all the other vac containers so it increases the risk by a magnitude um, of however many blood uh, containers that you need. So we only recommend this when absolutely necessary. Thank you. And some